your computer. There we are. Here we are. Okay. Well, hello everybody and welcome to Between Two Teachers. This is uh, Friday, August the 21st, and uh, my name is Consuelo Lara. And I'm Madeline Cronenberg. And once again, we're coming to you from the sacred ancestral lands of the Chochenyo Karkin Ohlone people, who we always want to remember and honor when we gather together to, to talk to you. And uh, today, we're talking about continuing in the pandemic. This is all about education in pandemic times. Yes. Uh, and reopening schools and all of the challenges about reopening schools. Yes. Uh, I've put into the, into the uh, resource link that is uh, on our Trello page for under 82120, um, a couple of things. I just wanted to share out with you some systems, some resources for parents, because I know there are lots of, uh, first of all, there are a lot of new parents, the new TK parents and the new kindergarten parents. And um, even the first grade parents who are, who are new to, all, uh, we're all new to all of it, but uh, resources for, for parents in particular. And there are lots of them out there, but this is just one more uh, resource list. And the other thing I, I, I've included is something uh, for teachers that I thought was particularly uh, useful. And it's just how to do virtual rewards. Because teachers in their classrooms are always looking for ways to support kids and, and give them uh, different types of virtual rewards. Um, and nobody, we didn't have to do virtual rewards before. So you had to switch your system over to something you could do virtually. And, uh, and so, you know, there are lots of smart people out there. And one thing about this whole world of distance learning is everybody's in it now. And people are being really good about sharing what they've learned and their good ideas. And so that's what this is. This is just a, some, some really interesting good ideas around virtual rewards. And I know all of our, you know, in West Contra Costa and, and all the other districts, teachers are sharing all the time and figuring out what works for them and what's working in, in their classrooms, in their own groups at their schools and, um, and more broadly in, in, in really national groups, right? Yeah. And sometimes even international groups. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Um, so there's that. And then, then I wanted to start to just mention locally, our uh, county has allowed us to have a waiver, which is very interesting, all things considered because we now have fires. I mean, really, I think we would be home today anyhow because the, the air is so yep. so challenging. Yep. And, you know, so many communities are evacuating, right? California is, is, is burning up. And, and it's really early. It's not September or October. This is, you know, this is in August. So we're victims of, of climate change. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, the county yeah. has allowed school districts or, or, or uh, schools, any private schools as well, or, and uh, charter schools, any school, yeah. you know, to I, get a waiver. I wonder about that if uh, that's a result of the fact that, you know, we've, we've made the decision to stay uh, sheltered in place, but that brings up the issue of childcare. And so if that, yeah. and we have not solved that problem. And so that's why I think, oh, well then maybe, you know, we could have a waiver. I think that's where that came from, the fact that we have to have, you know, good childcare for people. I, I just kind of think the two are linked together, you know. They're totally linked. They're, they are completely linked, all right? I mean, my daughter sent me uh, a picture of uh, our, our grandson starting uh, first grade today. Well, he's not alone. Who's his teacher? He has Mrs. Schultz, who is his teacher on uh, it, uh, on the screen, but mommy is the teacher, and and all mommies are the teachers. You yeah. know, we don't have your five year old and six year old sitting there with a a Chromebook by themselves at all. Yeah, right? mommy's there the whole time. Yeah. Well, you know, how is mommy supposed to be working? No, nope. policymakers need to jump on this and get us some universal childcare. It needs to be. This is a crisis situation. This is like like in the war they had 24-hour childcare. 
We need something right. to help us. Right. They figured that out, right? So, so we have we have the the building you can go to in um, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, down by Neistrom Elementary School. There was the first 24-hour child care that was built in uh, in the city of Richmond for children of the families and of the women who had to work to build the Liberty ship to win the war. Yep. Right. Yep. And the difference now is with a lot of these women are working at home, but how are they? And, and, uh, it's very challenging to expect them to do two things at one time and do it well. Yep. So, yeah. right. Wow. It, it's a challenge for, for our, our, our parents who, who struggle with education, who are less educated to begin with who are, you know, uh, very uh, intimidated by the technology. But it's also a challenge for the parents who, who may have no problem with the technology, but have to be doing something else at the same time. Still, everybody's affected. Oh, it's a, such a woman's issue, isn't it? And it's like, pay some attention to this. You know, we need It some really, really is. Yeah, we need it some really solutions. Is. Need some solutions. So anyway, this waiver okay. is available. And All right. uh, we'll see if anybody applies for it. I think the only ones who could probably make this would be uh, the private schools, some very small private schools that have it set up to do small classes anyhow. But, yeah. uh, okay. but we'll know more next week. We can say if anybody actually has done it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that happened this week is that Governor Newsom did sign the ethnic studies law for the CSU. So that's a done deal. That, that happened. Yep. And, uh, and very good. that's the uh, you know, we need to move on, and there's still, you know, endless amounts of work that need to be due to, done to change all of our curriculum and change the perspectives in our curriculum. But these are all the steps on the path to make it happen. Yeah. So. And I think in our district, it would be great. We used to have curriculum committees. I think an ethnic studies curriculum committee of all the ethnic studies teachers to get together and talk about pedagogy and curriculum. I think also... Right. Countywide would be a great network of representatives from each district to talk about what they're That's doing. That's a great idea. Study. We could elevate this uh, whole area. And it's such a grassroots, you know, concept. So um, I'm just thrilled that they've done that. I just think it's wonderful. I am too. Yeah. And I think that's, a, you know, that's somewhere where Contra Costa County could be a leader. Right. Yeah. What do you think to say that yeah. there, there may be some others that have already started because I'm sure there are ethnic studies teachers throughout the, country, throughout the state that are hard at work and help make this happen. And I don't want to diminish the fact that obviously a lot of hard work went into that. That's but true. We, it, it, true. It, the important thing is to hook up with the people that have been doing all that hard work so that, yes. you know, we can that we can uh, uh, join them and amplify. Yeah, what we'll bring doing. that. We'll bring that other information, too, as it. Yeah. We'll bring that. Okay. And uh, then there's uh, LAUSD. Now, LAUSD has an interesting, so they are run by Superintendent Butner, who uh, comes from the business world. He's not the teacher. And what one thing he did was somehow uh, set up a collaboration. He has a plan. And basically, he will provide regular COVID-19 testing and contact tracing to school staff, students, and their families. Hmm. Hmm. Right? The district will provide it. And the way that's happening is he is, uh, has a program uh, with LAUSD and UCLA at Stanford and Johns Hopkins. And Microsoft and testing experts and healthcare companies like Anthem, Blue Cross, and HealthNet. And they're all going to be a test for, uh, on a task force with Butner and our old friend Arnie Duncan. Ah. Remember Arnie Duncan? Oh no. <laughs> Arnie is, well, they're privatizing this. This is what's going to happen with this testing. We can assume this is going to happen. But nonetheless, they're doing it. And, no, and so I give them credit for getting this started. And uh, they're the only school district, I mean, they're the second largest school district in the country. New York has a very low rate right now and they're like under one percent they went from the biggest set of problems to under one percent so their their needs are different i think than they are in los angeles right um but los angeles is moving ahead so it's something to look for and to see whether or not there's a conversation about doing the same thing throughout the rest of the state 
or if it's going to be county by county, you know, how are we going to look at um, testing? And, and then it will probably also need, we need to know whether the tests are, um, are the tests that can be read very quickly so that you know on a daily basis if your, uh, what your testing status is. Yeah, because we haven't talked about that here. We haven't given that no. attention. We need to. Yeah. No, nobody. It's, it's an interesting point, but it, it really hasn't been discussed. Yeah. Um, all right. So then we get to the low. Now you want to tell us what is happening as far as the local, what's, what's happening in our next uh, agenda. Yeah. The, right now, of course, the digital divide, as we keep progressing into this pandemic, it feel this digital divide is getting bigger and bigger um, and uh, it's now more important than ever for partnerships so there's going to come to the board a resolution uh, that the, we form federal state local partnerships and uh, to build long-term in, infrastructure solutions that can be very reliable for our family. So people are working on this and they see this as the a big issue and are working. We're going outside the box. We're going, the district cannot do this alone. We need no. everybody to participate in this. And I think that's what this resolution is gonna be all about because we want high quality learning opportunities. That is all of our goals. Sometimes people come and act like we don't care about that. This is all of our goals. So, um, it's coming forth, and I think that's going to be a real plus uh, for us on that issue. Uh, what else? Yeah, and, and the thing people don't understand is when you pass a resolution, there, there are action steps behind that, right? It's not just, I mean, you can pass a resolution honoring somebody, and, and that's fine. When you pass a resolution honoring or, or, or uh, aligning with the fact that it's a, a certain month, a month to celebrate a certain group, and that's one thing. But these kinds of resolutions have action steps behind them, and it's, they're really important decisions to decide to pass them. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It really, it says about the direction, it tells you about the goals, it tells you what our values are, it, it has a lot of, and then even some ne next steps. So there's, you know, no uh, mystery about what it is we're trying to do here. So that's really important. And um, so that's coming up. And then there's going to be presentations from our youth, our young, our uh, trustees. We've got two new student trustees, Stephanie Garcia Avila, shout out, Richmond High School, and Candon Cotton Blake from Middle College High School. So shout out to them. We're gonna, they're going to be able to do presentation about the youth commission and uh, you know, it's so important for us to give them that voice Absolutely. on that platform. And that's one of the things we know. So that will be coming up. And then under some discussion and even some action, we're going to talk more about the phase uh, of coming back to school. So the memorandum of understanding, the MOU. And I have to say, you know, you get 91% of labor management, you know, in agreement that is so powerful. I mean, you know, I think about as a teacher, the votes about decisions rarely got 91% of agreement. Right. Teachers. That's pretty amazing. But then the next thing is the conditions, because we will return someday soon, hopefully. What is the, what are going to be the conditions for reopening? So that's the next um, kind of phase that, that needs to be looked at under discussion and, and, uh, and review. Uh, we're going to be looking at the grading policy for distance learning. I don't think anything has been solidified, but we're uh, exploring all those options right now. Um, and students are strong presence in that in that decision. I think so. That's so so important, right? Because what we really need to do is is honor the student voice in this, and our students. Um, understand their own circumstances and their circumstances here are not what they were before and then the other whole part of that grading policy is it connects to testing and how much do we need the testing anyhow right we are being moved into uh, uh, project-based learning that's what we, we're doing being online and that is a, not a bad thing 
mean, that's something we've talked about for years, and it's taken a long time to for it to get traction. But in, it's one of the circumstances, consequences of distance learning, is project-based learning is what uh, what everyone is is getting an opportunity to explore, and that teachers are getting an opportunity to develop. Exactly. And what comes with project based learning is a particular kind of assessment that is exactly. multiple measures and it tells you way more than any of those horrible standardized tests. Way more. Exactly. So, uh, so all of this goes into grading, right? The grading of a project, what you can, <clears throat> excuse me, what you can do in project based learning and how it is graded is totally different from the high stakes testing that we were doing before. Absolutely, absolutely. And then uh, last thing I have is that we're gonna look at our board, board policy for social media. I mean, we're using it more often. We've gotta have protocols, we've gotta have boundaries and you know, nothing's ever set in stone, but we have to have this discussion and yeah. we need to protect our, our community, our children. So all of that, uh, we have to have protocols around social media, I think. So that will be on there as well. So, oh, and then because of the fires, we've had to move the back to school nights and uh, the, the dates have been moved later. So those will be on the website, I'm sure. And, oh, now we got fires. What's next? <laughs> what yeah, else? I know. What else right. can we take? So that's pretty much my report there from the. From well, that's funny. But there's a lot happening. And, uh, you know, everyone's adjusting to this, to the new way of, of teaching. And one thing is that our teachers have gotten a lot more professional development around how to be comfortable in front of a screen. Right, and and for us, some of our teachers are they they were given the flexibility to go into the, their school building and teach in their classroom, or not, if that's not going to work for them, and they they want to. It's important for them to stay at home, and that will work better than to be able to stay at home, because certainly there doesn't need to be one size does not fit all when it comes exactly. to where you're going to exactly. deliver them. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's the same as our children. Honestly, if, if, one, if our children and in, in their families in, in their solution to child care have children who are no longer even in the district, they could be staying with relatives who are taking care of them, who are, but it doesn't matter. They're still enrolled and they're still attending because it, it, their geographic location is not a problem. Yeah. yeah. They just have to have Wi-Fi. That's, that's, the problem. that's the big issue. And that's where we need all hands on deck to help solve that problem for sure. Right. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, so let's, uh, there's a couple of things under take action. Uh, one of them is there's a uh, uh, organization called diversify our narrative. And um, you can take a look at what they're doing. They are working on the, the project of uh, uh, creating diverse anti-racist textbooks in U.S. high schools, and there's a whole strategy and action strategy around that, and so that's, I have that uh, plugged in here, diversify our narrative. Yep. Um, another one is uh, from a group called Cal Justice, uh, which demand corporations support Black Lives Matter, and, and this is, we've talked about this with other groups. Sometimes a corporation has a uh, has a front facing message saying, oh yes, we support Black Lives Matter. We support all kinds of social justice issues. And then they put money against Prop 15. Yeah. Totally duplicitous, right? Total hypocrisy. And mm -hmm. apparently somebody that's done this is um, Farmers Insurance. Oh. And Farmers Insurance is, a, is apparently now a big funder of uh, stop Prop 15. And Prop 15, of course, is right. And so this is, and this is what we're gonna see over and over again. We saw this before in Prop 55, when the billionaires who were going to have to pay the extra tax said up front, oh yes, we're here for the children. And they funded the Stop Prop 55 campaign. Mm. So, yeah. 
So it's one thing, if you're going to be against it, I, I can at least honor you and say, like the taxpayers, they never say they're for anything, the taxpayer associations. So at least you know where they are. The people who are trying to to uh, to lie to you about who they are, I think is uh, that is what Cal Justice is calling out here. So this is a petition about that. Good, and, good. And also, it just shows that we have to pay attention and look for who the funding, who is funding what. And in California, they do have to put it on the bottom of of, uh, of flyers and, and in ads. So we just need to pay attention to where the money is coming from, which uh, comes back to the whole issue of privatization. And in uh, there's, I've got an article in here by Carl Peterson. He's from LA. And uh, he is having school board candidates give their positions on charter school double dipping in the payroll protection plan. Wow. Now, in our, in our district, there were, uh, out of the charter schools that we have, there certainly were double dippers. And these are charter schools that took money that was meant for small businesses because they're, they are businesses, right? And at the same time, they didn't lose any money from the money from the money they would they get from state and federal support. Jeez. So this is extra money. The district didn't get this no. qualified to ask for this extra money. Nope. And so I've got the list here. A method uh, asked for the, the, you can ask for a range. They asked for from two to five million. Caliber mm. asked for from two to five million. Leadership asked for two to five million. Making waves asked for two to five million. Manzanita asked for 350,000 to 1 million. But there, this has got to do with the size of their population that they qualify for to ask for. Summit, which is a, a bigger uh, network, asked for 5 million to 10 million. <sighs> and Voices asked for 2 to 5 million. Jeez. And it's just given to them, right? It's not, yeah. is it a loan? Yeah. No, it's not a loan. No. It's just no. free money. Right. Wow. Wow. Okay, well, and that's why people, you know, it, this is this is an issue, and it's an issue that when uh, when we have our parcel tax money, they want us, the, the district children, to share with the charter school children, but no effort is made to have the charter school children share out the money they're getting from this with the district children. Yeah, no, they would never consider that. They're not going to share. No, they're not going to share no. any of their privileged and uh, entitlements. Nope, we're not gonna see that. No. So anyway, so, so I have the list there and if you wanna check, if you click on the back of one of these cards, you'll see exactly where I got it from. There's a database that was out there that was put out nationally by In the Public Interest, our friends at In the Public Interest. Good. And, uh, and you can see that's where I got the, the numbers, right? The numbers are all from there. That's great, that's good, perfect. Uh, and then the last thing, I went to something uh, this week on, uh, on funding and running uh, programs for uh, uh, something called a children's budget. The uh, folks in, in Richmond, actually it was RISE that did this, uh, uh, had a, uh, a tax measure put on and that tax, the funding from that tax measure goes exclusively to programs that, uh, that uh, support children and, and, you, and young people, youth in the community. Yeah. There's a real movement to do that. So in our area, the only children who benefit from anything like that are the children in the city of Richmond because that money is spent exclu exclusively on them. Okay. And these are, uh, anyway, so the funding, um, so I've got a couple of, of links in here to three different groups, Funding the Next Generation, the Children's Funding Project, and Children's Cabinet Network. So for people who are interested in understanding how, I, I wanna solve the problems that we are underfunding. And there, there are a lot of solutions to underfunding children. And this group of, of, uh, of organizations are working really hard on these solutions. There was a, a woman who really came up with the answer for San Francisco and, and created funding streams for children in San Francisco, which is one of the reasons the children in San Francisco have 
answers to the child care problem. Because the community centers have the funding because they have these mechanisms in place right now to be able to offer these additional hubs and places where children can go for child care. Wow. The wow. only reason they have that, everybody says, well, how come everybody else can't do it? The reason they can't do it is they never put this in place, right? And it was not an easy process to be, uh, uh, Ms. Roderick, who is the, uh, who is the <coughs> founder, of the, the, uh, it, it is her brainchild, worked for many years to have it happen in San Francisco. But it is there now, and they are a model. And people don't think that San Francisco is a model for things about children, but they absolutely oh, yeah. are oh. a model about that. Big time. A lot of great stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's it. Now, uh, that's it for me. Do you have any else, anything you want to add? Nope. I think that covers it for now. Oh, gosh. That's a lot. Here we are in this pandemic. Just everybody, wear your mask. Don't touch your face. Stay home. Wash your hands. Do all of that. Do all of that. <laughs> all oh. of that. But we must get our, our, our comedy from Carlos. We got our comedy from Carlos. Okay. Madeline, why did the boy vote for the bicycle? I don't know, Consuela. Why did the boy vote for the bicycle? Because he liked how he spoke. And, and there we have it. Yet another brilliant. <laughs> on that silly <laughs> note, we'll say goodbye. Off we go. We'll see you next week and let you know what, uh, where we are. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, that's the wrong video.